So are there other people who are, have listened to, to, to your presentation? Uh, in the same vein, we will continue uh, with our critical view of Iranian politics over the last 30 years. And I would like to uh, present very, very briefly our next uh, distinguished uh, scholar, Professor Abbas Milani, uh, who is uh, Hamid and Christina Mogaddam, Director of Iranian Studies at Stanford University and the co-director of Iran Democracy Project and the research fellow at the Hoover Institution. His long list of publications and scholarly activities are known of all, I mean, to all who are Iranian students of Iranian studies. His latest book, or actually the one before his latest books, is actually a masterpiece and a bestseller, uh, and it deals with Abbas Hoveida, a political, a political biography of the Shah's long-standing uh, uh, prime minister who served until 1990, if I'm not wrong, 1977, yes? Yeah. yeah. So I would like to invite Professor Milani to give his presentation. The topic is the Shah and the Islamic Revolution, individual character, national destiny. Please, Professor Milani. Good morning. Uh, let me first thank uh, the Center for Iranian Studies for making this visit possible to Israel. Visiting Israel has uh, for many, many, many years been a dream of mine. Uh, I have often thought about it. The only chance I got was an eight-hour visit to uh, Jerusalem last year with my wife. And when this invitation came, I realized that uh, the final moment where I can have this dream fulfilled has arrived. So uh, I'm very grateful. Uh, I'm going to talk about the Shah. Uh, I am working on a book on the Shah that I'm hoping to finish very soon. And this is uh, parts of that book in a sense. He was born a soldier's son, grew into a reluctant king, and died a woeful pariah. He had the hesitant soul of a Hamlet and the public persona of a Herod. Long before there was any hint of a revolution, in their internal documents, Israeli sources had dubbed him Saul, the fourth, first anointed king of the Jews, a moody monarch, guilty of hubris, ultimately abandoned by God and defeated by the Philistines. He was a private man forced to live a public life under the constant scrutiny of an often critical media. During the height of his power, when a thousand flatterers sat in his throne, he was full of polit political braggadocio, regularly threatening and chiding not just his critics and foes, but his Western allies. Their democracy, he predicted more than once, will soon fail. It befitted only the blue-eyed world, he said, not just Iran, but the world was his oyster in those days. Iranian officers served in Morocco, helping with the war in Pelosario. Iranian special forces fought the communist insurgents in Oman's province of Dafar. In 1975, he went on what the CIA called a lending binge, giving away more than $2 billion to anyone who bothered to ask. London's water department, Jordan's road construction, Moroccan dams each received some part of the loyal right largesse. Only within a month of giving away this money, with the sharp decline in the price of oil, Iran was back borrowing money from the Chase Manhattan Bank. His grandiose sense of his own place, both in Iranian society and the world, was as much the result of Persian psychophancy as the obsequious flattery of Western leaders. In the, in the span of a few months, in 1975, his court minister, Alam, himself often critical of the psychophants around the Shah, compared the Shah to de Gaulle and to Napoleon. Nelson Rockefeller compared the Shah to Alexander the Great, adding, and I quote, we must take his majesty to the US for a couple of years so that he can teach us how to run a country. Within months of these extravagant binges of words and money, 
the moment the edifice of his power showed the, the first signs of a crack, not just his resolve, but his trust in his own judgment suddenly disappeared. His ability to steer the ship of state gave way to confusion, paranoia, and paralysis. He seemed all too ready to leave Iran. Contrary to the common perception, this absconding proclivity had long been a defining character of his royal majesty. Some of his supporters today blame his irresolution and his indecision, his eagerness to leave the country in 1975 on the six milligrams of chlorambucil he was taking to fight his lymphoma, and the regular dose of Valium he took every day to calm his jittery nerves and fight his lifelong problem of insomnia. Chlorambucil, as the drug manufacturers declare, is known to bring about depression, paranoia, confusion, indecision, and a murky mind. But this was not the first time the Shah had shown an absconding proclivity. His readiness to leave the scene of a crisis, and with it the throne, can be seen in the fact that between 1941, when in the afternoon of August 6th, and the afternoon of August, uh, I'm sorry, when in the afternoon uh, of August 16, he tried to leave with his father, to the early hours of August 15, when early in the morning he left Clardash for Baghdad and then Rome, according to American and British embassy documents, the Shah had come close to leaving the country at least five times. In 1948, for example, he threatened the American and the British embassies that he would abdicate if they would not agree to his desire to amend the Constitution and increase his power. Around the same time, he delivered an ultimatum to the Majlis, giving them four months to agree to these changes or he would resign. As early as 1946, a British official, after a long audience with the Shah, surmised that the Shah was most inclined, quote, towards running away morally, if not physically, from any crisis. A myth has long survived among students and scholars of modern Iran about the Shah's first 12 years in power. He was, they say, a liberal at heart, happily resigned to his constitutional role as a figurehead monarch. The hardships and humiliations of the Mossadegh era, the myth goes, hardened his heart, steeled his resolve, and turned him into an authoritarian despot. Little of this myth bears any resemblance to archival reality. From his first days in office, the Shah was more than convinced that Iran can make progress only when power is concentrated in the hands of the king. More than once he told the American and British embassies in this period that it is futile and altogether impossible to be a constitutional monarch in Iran. More than once he threatened to abdicate if forced to play simply the role of a figurehead. The trauma of August 53 did convince the Shah that henceforth he would never allow a person of independent political base to become a prime minister. As Iran's oil revenue grew, so did the Shah's cult of personality and his belief that he was infallible. Whereas in 1959, in a meeting with economists, he readily admitted his ignorance of economic laws and invited them to offer, his, offer him their advice, in 1975, he curtly dismissed all such advice as a mere nuisance. By then, he had grown more and more intolerant of saucy minions. He had become convinced that he could run the economy by royal fiat. In a now famous interview with Oriana Falacci, he went so far as to claim that he was in direct communion with God. In a less famous discussion with one of his authorized biographies, biographers in 1976, he claimed that ever since coming to the throne, his every major decision had been guided by the wisdom of the divine. Long before dismissing the advice of the economists, particularly those who believed Iran did not have the capacity to absorb all the new oil revenues. Indeed, not long after getting rid of General Zahedi in 1955, the Shah, with the exception of the Amini period, was in fact his own prime minister. As a result, the constitutionally mandated separation between the Shah as the ultimate symbol of the regime and the cabinet as the embodiment of the executive branch was gradually marred. The Shah took, out, took, out, took over every decision, took credit for every accomplishment, 
and in good times dissatisfied his craving for adoring the public. But when a major crisis set in, as it did in 1977, the people's demand for change inexorably became a demand for regime change. The Shah's fervent belief in conspiracy theories, his conclusion that whatever has, is happening to him is the result of British, American, or Soviet conspiracy, further clouded his ability to see the real causes for the popular discontent. The Shah kept changing the cabinet, trying to assuage this or that big power, whereas the people wanted him removed. He was neither by temperament nor by health at the time capable of handling such a crisis. The Shah had had a troubled childhood. He spent the first few years of his life only in the company of women. His doting and domineering mother, his doltish older sister, who was a darling of the parents, and finally his twin sister, who had an almost totemic, sometimes suffocating attachment to his brother. His mother was devotedly religious, but hers was the religious religion of amulets and evil eyes, of Nazar Orbani and Nazr. The young boy was not untouched by this form of religiosity. By the time the young Muhammad was seven years old, he had, he claimed, within the span of one year, three saintly visits, two of whom actually saved his life. While his mother cherished these saintly apparitions as sure signs of divine blessing, his father, Reza Shah, whose love and approval the young boy naturally craved, dismissed them as nonsense. They are, he said, womanly prattle, unbecoming a future king. Kings, Shakespeare tells us, are born to command, not to sue. The young Muhammad Reza, as the son of a military man and a traditional religious mother, was certainly born to sue and then expected to command. Machiavelli and his contemporary Shakespeare both knew well that borrowed majesty is a hard thing to accomplish, that the age of inherited or divine legitimacy is fast fading. Monarchies seem incompatible with the age of modernity, with the age of natural rights of man and investigative journalists, inquisitive scholars, archives, all capture the life of a royalty in its every mundane detail, leaving little to the subject's imagination. Monarchies require a certain degree of opacity, and modernity is an age of forced transparencies. Even Iran's own history was a poignant rem reminder of the troubled nature of monarchy as an institution. Since 1840, every Iranian monarch, say one, Muzaffaruddin Shah, who signed the constitutional decree, had either died by an assassin or in exile and dethroned. The odds were thus against the Shah when he assumed the throne. The Shah often tried to create the loving image of his father, Reza Shah, but the ghost of this troubled father-son relationship cast an unrelenting shadow over the life of the Shah. Those close to him knew that they must not praise the father too much in the son's presence. In his own three books, the Shah is singularly called to the memory of his father, offering faint praise at best. Even in his memoir, while there are almost 500 references to the father, compared to only six to the mother, they often have a critical edge to them. He writes of how he was emotionally bruised when he came to realize that his father had no trust in his ability to safely steer the ship of state. Later in the same memoir, while chastising his father for not having any trust in his ability to keep the throne, he also writes that his father's greatest genius in life was his ability to know the true metal of every man he met. Texts, as literary critics remind us, often tell us more about their authors than the authors themselves intend. Putting these two different passages together, his recounting of the story of his father's distrust and his belief that the true metal, the, the father's genius was knowing the metal of man, it is hard to avoid the conclusion that therein lies at least one source for the Shah's lingering self-doubts and insecurity. No less clear is the conclusion that his unique form of fragile grandiosity and diffidence were in reality a compensation for these self-doubts. Like his father, the Shah was certainly bent on extricating Iran from a long and vicious circle of poverty and backwardness. They were all both advocates of their own peculiar narratives of modernity. 
while they rigorously pursued modernization of the country's economy and its infrastructure, they did not adhere to modern ideas about democracy. For them both, their authoritarianism was the necessary and legitimate price to pay for modernization. More than once, the Shah reiterated his belief that he, would be, he, he could convince or co-opt the middle and technocratic classes to acquiesce to his authoritarianism by enriching them beyond their dreams of avarice. A dream, ironically, today shared by many in the Islamic Republic known as advocates of the China model. The China model says the whole power, give a little bit of economic welfare to the people and the middle class, and people will acquiesce to regime of the faqih. In his unrelenting advocacy of his own peculiar notion of modernity, the Shah provoked a revolution whose patriarch was a man bent on demodernizing Iran and establishing a theocratic autarchy in the country. The Shah was at once an enigmatic failure and a pivotal figure of our times, a man who loved his country not wisely but too well. The Shah and his father shared nearly every element of their paradigms of authoritarian modernity. They both believed in the indispensable necessity of an authoritarian monarch. They both afforded a key, if not decisive role, to the state in jump-starting the economy on its march to progress. As the Shah showed in the case of forced nationalization of Habib Sabet's television, Rezaei's mines, and in a sense, even during the land reform, he was more than his father willing to expropriate not just the language, but the actions of radical socialism to implement his plans. During the time of their much praised land reform, one man had the wisdom to see the dangers of this kind of expropriation as a prelude to revolution. His name was Abul Hassan Ayyab Tahaj. And though he was at, time in, at the time in prison, he wrote a letter to his American friends warning against the Shah's land reform as a policy that undermined the sanctity of private property. If Iran is to become a capitalist economy, Abtahaj wrote, the state must recognize the sanctity of private property. More than a decade later, in 1975, Senator Lajavadi, the scion of a prominent industrialist family, made much the same point, adding to it the necessity of the rule of law. While Abtahaj offered a series of fiscal and monetary policies that would enrich the coffers of the state, and end absentee landlordism through taxation and keep intact the value of private property, Lajavadi simply asked for the rule of law, offering the requisite praise for the Shah's genius for leadership. The Shah ignored both of these suggestions, just as, just as he ignored the clamor of the clergy, who also defended the sanctity of private property, albeit not based on macroeconomic thought, but micro-theological arguments. Many scholars point to the speech the Shah made on the day after the appointment of a military government as a turning point in the victory of the revolution. Just on the day he needed to show a steely resolve, he looked most, most pathetic. The Shah talked that day repentantly about his past errors, promised that he had now, quote, heard the message of your revolution. He promised to henceforth abide by the Constitution. That talk, many scholars claim, was the first time the word revolution was used to refer to what had been till then an incipient movement. But in reality, long before that speech, in his obsessive effort to out-revolutionize the revolutionaries, the Shah had both by words and deeds made revolutionary change and a state expropriation of private property an acceptable part of the country's political lexicon. Other elements of the Shah's policies also prepared the ground for the revolution that was to come in 79. The Shah and his father were both willing to use the coercive power of the state to replace market mechanism, even control the prices. They both believed that the key sectors of the economy must remain a monopoly of the state. They both valued industrialization, and for both having a steel mill was the ultimate economic sign of modernity. For the Shah in the 70s, the steel mill was at least partially supplanted by a nuclear program. They both believed in using agriculture to facilitate industrial development. They wanted a more educated working 
class, a larger and better trained technocratic class, a more affluent middle class. They both believed women should be enfranchised. They both saw Iran's future tied to the West and to fighting communism. They both saw urbanization as a key to progress, and they believed in the urgency of the modernized infrastructure. They were both fierce advocates of cultural and aesthetic modernity, so long as it did not threat in political waters. For both Iran's imperial grandeur in its pre-Islamic days was the essential ingredient of a new national cultural identity. They were both surprisingly modern in their support for Iran's persecuted religious minorities. According to Professor Menasheri, the Shah's period was for Iranian Jews a golden era of economic opportunity. And save for the calamitous attack on the Baha'i centers in 1955, the Shah afforded them too a protection against religious zealots. And the Shah and his father both considered a strong military under their own direct control a necessary element for the success of their modernization project. But father and son dif differed, and differed drastically on their views on the role and place of religion and of the clergy in their paradigms of modernity. To no small me measure, the root of the Islamic revolution of 1979 must be found in the combination of these differences and the reluctance of both father and son to allow the development of a moder moderate, secular, loyal opposition. Reza Shah, acting in a spirit much akin to Ataturk in Turkey, moved aggressively to limit the role and number of the clergy in Iran. From the time he took over in 1925 to the time he left the country in 41, though the population had doubled, the number of mosques in the whole country was reduced by half, converting many of them to other uses, including an opera house. Moreover, during his days, the clergy needed a government permit to wear the turban and the gown that afforded them their social status. Till then, the clergy had been a self-regulating body. Reza Shah also moved to deprive the clergy of not just their revenues from running the judiciary and education system, but of their lucrative guardianship of VAFs, religious endowments that covered such institutions as mosques, seminaries, and hospitals. School texts were ordered to be thoroughly secularized, imbued with the fervent new nationalism devoid of Islam. The Shah, on the other hand, saw the clergy, the inconvenience of radical minorities notwithstanding, as his indispensable ally against communists, and his crucial new paradigm was evident from his first days on the peacock throne. His own faith, his belief that he was indeed God's anointed, added a certain sense of personal urgency to this political paradigm. His tendency and desire to use religion as an ideological cement of, cement of his power was evident even in his oath of office. Compared to his father's oath, Muhammad Reza Shah was surprisingly redolent of Islamic ideas. Of its 99 words, 49 were directly related to some religious concept. In the case of Reza Shah, only 10 of the total 72 words in his oath had any relationship to Islam. The Shah's desire to infuse his discourse with Shiite concepts continued unabated for the rest of his reign. A few years after ascending the throne, he claimed, quote, Islamic tenets are humanity's source of salvation. Following these rules in my time and in any other time will bring common welfare and comfort. The Shah had by then decided that his main enemy were the communists. He saw Russian expansionism infused with an equally aggressive Marxist ideology as his main target. After the events of 1953, he added Mossadegh's supporters to the list of his enemies. To realize his dream of using the clergy against his enemies, particularly against the communists, the Shah took several key steps. First and foremost, he made peace with the clergy. In June 3, 1943, exactly 20 years before the Shah met with the greatest religious challenge to his rule, Ayatollah Hussein Qomim, virtually forced into exile by Reza Shah eight years earlier, returned home to a hero's welcome. Even before returning, 
Ayatollah had let everyone know that he was returning at the direct invitation of the Shah. He was not lying. But the Shah was not deterred by the opposition of many of his allies in affording such a man this heroic welcome. He had concluded by then that the mullahs are, quote, all royalists at heart. What the Shah failed to realize is that some mullahs might well believe all of what he attributed to them, but might well also have dreams of powers themselves. A few days after settling back in his native city of Mashhad, Ayatollah Qomi wrote a note to the prime minister demand, demanding uh, action on the issues he had raised with the Shah. On August 20th, 1943, the Ayatollah received a letter from the prime minister informing that all of his demands had been met. Women will be henceforth allowed to appear in public any way they chose. The vaqfs will be returned to the clergy. In approving the Ayatollah's third demand, the government decided to make classes on Islamic theology and ethics a mandatory part of the curriculum. The clergy were put in charge of determining the content of these uh, demands. Ayatollah Ghomi was wanted also a closing of all co-educational schools the government acceded to this demand as well. The clergy, always in tune with the political pulse of the society, realized that a new era had begun, that the Reza Shah's policy of weakening them had ended. When in 1945, Ayatollah Burujadi was hospitalized in Tehran, and the Shah made a point of making a much publicized visit to his bedside, the symbolism was all not lost on the clergy. The clergy, the Shah said more than once, shoulder a great responsibility in ensuring that the state does not wear off the path of Islam. He lived to rue the day he uttered those words. What is remarkable is that the Shah continued to subscribe to this strategic assessment of his foes and friends and of the potential of an alliance with the clergy against his foes in spite of the fact that both assassination attempts on his life, once in 49 and then again in 65, were undertaken by religious zealots, and then for apparent expedient political reasons, both attributed to the left. Every prime minister assassinated during the Shah's reign was killed by Islamic terrorists. The biggest massive uprising against this regime in June 1963 was masterminded by clergy. Several factors contributed to this incredible obstinacy in the face of facts. Those were, after all, the days of the Cold War, and the Shah was constantly reminded by his allies of the communist threat. After all, even after the fall of the Shah, the CIA still believed it could use religious forces and zealots against the spread of Soviet Union in Afghanistan. Se second, in a couple of crucial moments in his rule, in 1951 and in 1953, it was the clergy's decision to abandon Mossadegh that ensured the Shah's victory in his struggle with his nemesis. Finally, the ties he and his court had developed with such moderate ayatollahs as Khoyi, Hakim, Shariat Madari, and Burujadi, each much higher than Khomeini in Shiite hierarchy, and their unabashed support for monarchy had convinced the Shah of the veracity of his strategic analysis. What he failed to realize is that within the very network dominated by these moderate ayatollahs, radical supporters of Ayatollah Khomeini had developed a supple and sophisticated, multifaceted network of organizations, and that in time of crisis, pressure from these radicals, and more importantly, from the bazaars, traditionally the most important source of support for any Ayatollah's coffer, and by 1975 disgruntled from the Shah's economic modernization and the push to move the country's center of economic gravity away from the bazaar would force moderate Ayatollahs into caution, if not silence. The Shah's own piety, his belief that he was in communion with God, might well have uh, further convinced them of this theory. A shocking indication of how far the Shah and Savak insisted on this flawed strategy was evident less than two years before the revolution. When, in 1977, Savak, 
offered every imprisoned clergy a deal that in retrospect boggles the mind. If each clergy would sign a letter promising to criticize Marxism as much as they criticized the Shah, they would be freed. By then, religious forces had schools of their own where they taught their own curriculum, a financial system that allowed them to solicit millions of dollars, a charitable network, literally hundreds of organizations of every type, from those organizing Quran readings and taking young boys and girls to summer camps, to those celebrating with noticeable lavishness the birth of the 12th Imam. While Savak was busy fighting the communists and the nationalists, the Islamists were busy following what in retrospect seems the perfect copy of Antonio Gramsci's model, building within the civil society a vast network of organizations for every strata of Iran. The Shah and Savak were not the only ones to miss the boat. The Iranian intellectual milieu, dominated by the left and its self-congratulatory, self-appointed role as the messianic vanguard of the society, deluded by their belief that religion is the opium of the people, also paid no attention to the encroaching, encroaching influence of religion. Some, like Al Ahmad, even embraced this encroachment, celebrated as a new panacea for Iran. The Shah's support for his vision was not limited to verbal signs of support. He helped drastically increase the number of mosques in the country. During his tenure, the number of mosques increased to more than 55,000. Some have put the figure as close to 70,000. The number of his religious schools also witnessed a sharp rise. Only in 1960, the number of religious schools went from 154 to 240. The rise in the number of mosques in the Shah's last decade is the most startling. Between 1965 to 1975, the number of mosques in the country went from less than 70 per city to over 440 per city. Tehran University had no mosques when it was built, but by 1970s, it had a big mosque at the center of the campus. Other campuses around the country were also infused with the Quran rooms, often with the acquiescence of Savak. An American official who had served in Iran two tours of duty tried to answer the question of what went wrong in Iran. He concluded that the Shah's system of rule depended on an iron, on a, a system depended upon a firm hand at the top, supported by a ruthless security mechanism and the financial capacity to reduce dissatisfaction through development programs, subsidies, and co-option of the opposition. By 1977, the downturn in the price of oil limited the regime's capacity to control discontent. The need for a firm hand at the top was redoubled, but then the human rights policy of Jimmy Carter, the Shah's cancer, the medications he was taking, and most important of all, the quirks of his own character, a hamlet hiding behind a herod, and the fact that during his herod he had decimated the moderate secular opposition and had allowed only the clergy the right to organize and mobilize their forces. And finally, the fact that in 1975, when he was at the height of his power, instead of relinquishing some of it to moderate forces, he created a pseudo-fascist one-party system called the Rastakhis, a stillborn political monster, causing the ire of many, all worked hand in hand and made the revolution in 1979 inevitable. In retrospect, there is little mystery to the revolution. The real mystery is why no one predicted it. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Mileni, for your broad and uh, concise uh, etiology, or at least partial etiology of the Islamic Revolution. <laughs>